Well, good evening, church family. Welcome back to Wisdom Wednesday. Tonight, we are in Psalm 22. So if you have your Bibles handy, which is always, I trust that you do, go ahead and make your way there. Psalm 22, it's a longer one. So uh, we're not going to be able to do as much of a deep dive as we usually try to do in some of the text. Uh, but what I want you to notice here in this particular psalm is uh, more who is speaking and who they are speaking to and what uh, what they're speaking about. This is one of David's psalms and one where he's uh, really kind of bearing his soul. Uh, but he's going through a situation that I think, or at least an emotion, I should say. Uh, our situations are very different from David's, but um, he's going through an emotion that I believe uh, really resonates with many of us. And so uh, let's go ahead and, as we always do, open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll step into our text. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray as we step into our uh, word this, this evening, uh, Lord, that you would uh, just be with us, uh, Lord, that you reveal uh, yourself in a new way and help us to understand you, uh, Lord, in light of uh, David's heartfelt emotion. Um, Lord, we, we certainly go through very similar uh, feelings and, and times of loneliness, and that's really uh, what we're going to explore here in the text, this time of loneliness and this time of worry um, of, of where you are in his life. And uh, Lord, I think if we're all being honest, uh, we certainly struggle with that as well. So, uh, give us a word of encouragement here tonight. Uh, Lord, help us to know that you are truly with us, even when uh, it may not look that way uh, in, in our short-sightedness, Lord. Uh, remind us of your presence. Remind us of your, your, your sovereignty and your providence in our lives. And um, help us to be renewed in our faith in you. And we ask all these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. So Psalm 22, as always, I'm going to put it up on the screen here, um, and you can go ahead and read along. And uh, I'm actually going to read from the screen here because I'm going to need to change screens, so I want to make sure I change along at the right time. Uh, so let's read this together. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction, the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. 
Before him shall bow all who go down to dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation that they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Now let's go ahead and hop back to the beginning of this one. I mentioned in the beginning I wanted to take a look at really who was speaking and who he was speaking to. This is, of course, again, uh, one of David's psalms here. And there's this, this theme throughout of David sort of feeling as though God has abandoned him, or at least in the first half of this psalm. You see kind of a, a shift at the end there where he is reminded uh, of God's presence in his life. But as we see here, this this crying out, and I've sort of highlighted these, trying to kind of break them up by by who's speaking and, and uh, who he's speaking to. It's David throughout that is speaking, but who he is speaking to. Um, and so these orange sections are here. Uh, sections here are where he is um, crying out to God. Uh, again, this you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night but I find no rest. This is similar to some other Psalms that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks. Um, in this, this sort of feeling of calling out to God, but not getting an answer. Uh, and here, of course, David is very much feeling that. And we, uh, this, this is the part of it that I think really resonates with our circumstances sometimes. There are times where it feels like our prayers really don't get past the ceiling, right? We sort of, we, we cry out to God and it doesn't seem like there's any immediate response, but we uh, we live in this kind of world that expects sort of an, an immediate response to everything that we do, and we don't understand that you know God works in a much different uh, time frame, right? He he delivers things in exactly his time, precisely when they need to happen, which may not line up with our timeline. Uh, and so when we look at this, you know, we recognize how how impatient we can be uh, at times. And one thing that I want to point out here is David is making an assumption here uh, that, that again, we, we may often uh, make. David makes the assumption that God has forsaken him, right? At no point in time has God told him that he has forsaken him. In fact, on numerous occasions, God has told him that he would not forsake him. God has told him that he, uh, that he loves him, that he cares for him, that he would provide for him, that he would give him many blessings. Uh, at no point has God told him that he had been forsaken, yet this is the assumption uh, that that David is making here, uh, that God has forsaken him. Uh, again, we, we fall into that same trap sometimes. When we don't see God moving in our lives for a period of time, our immediate response is that surely he must have forsaken us. And we do this in other areas of life too, right? That one person that you know, uh, you know, doesn't call you back. And immediately we say, you know, we say to ourselves, well, they must not like me anymore, right? It's it's not just the way that we treat God. This is the, the natural inclination that we seem to have uh, with many areas of life. But we, we apply this to God just as much. And the difference is, you know, God has promised his love to us. He has promised that he would care for us. And it takes almost nothing for us to start to doubt him in that. Let's go back to this text here. As, as David kind of reflects on his situation, he starts to contrast that with what he knows of God. Take a look at this. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In, your, uh, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So David is reminding himself of, uh, self of the truths that he has about God. So what he's saying is in light, in fact, you even see that in the, the use of the word yet there in verse 3, uh, in light of how he feels in verse 1 and 2, he's expressing this feeling, this is what I'm experiencing. But the truth, right, there's a difference sometimes between what we experience and the truth of the situation, how we feel about something versus what is actually happening. He's recognizing, I feel as though God is not hearing me, God has abandoned me, God is not listening to me, he has forsaken me, but I know, I know, right, I feel versus what I know, uh, that you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. He recognizes that God is holy, he is perfect, he knows that God has been faithful. In, in days past, right? In, in, uh, in you are father's trust. He's talking about generations past, right? God has been faithful uh, to his people this entire time. He would not abandon him 
there and now, right? God has been faithful. He has proven himself uh, to be trustworthy. Uh, and so in, in that, right, we can, we can have faith. Um, but again, David turns the, the mirror back on himself, right? But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. This is the, verse 8 here is the, the mocking of the people, right? They're simply saying, well, you know, if you trust in God, why can't God get you out of this mess? Why can't God fix your problem for you? As if, um, uh, you know, as if God isn't working on that, right? Or God is in, intending to uh, do so in, in his own way. Um, again, they're making that same assumption that David does, right? That if, if the problem hasn't gone away, that if there is a source of conflict in his life, then clearly God must not be there. Uh, again, that's a, that's a false assumption, right? We have no reason to believe that. The only reason that we think that is because our problem hasn't gone away immediately. Uh, but many times, I know this has been true in my life, if the problem that I knew about had gone away immediately, I would just simply have another problem right behind it, right? What God is doing is he is bringing about uh, the best good, right? If we can use that that term, the best good, whereas I would have settled for the more immediate good, which may not have been uh, what is best for me. It's just what makes me happy right now because, again, I'm I'm human, I'm flawed, and you know many of us are, are like that. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one, and and we can only see so far in as far as our circumstances and our situations and how we resolve things. Uh, so we think that what's right there in front of us, what's ailing us in the moment is the big problem. And God, of course, sees beyond that. And God is dealing with the bigger problems. And when we don't see our immediate situation change, we begin to doubt. Uh, again, David turns back to, to looking at God, to reminding himself of what he knows of God. You are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. He recognizes. So if you remember in the, the first section, right, verses 3 through 5, he's reflecting how faithful God has been uh, to his forefathers, right, the generations that had gone before him. And how God had uh, been faithful through all those. Now he's personalizing it. Right? He's saying, you know what? You've been my God since the very beginning. Right? It was you at the moment of my birth um, that, that brought me forth. It was you that has sustained me every day of my life up until this point. It is you that has kept me. And then here you see this, this change in the pleading. Right? He's still pleading to God, but it's different from this outcry of verse 1 and 2. Saying, be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. This is a much more honest and reflective plead to God. Right, The, the first one was made out of assumption. The second one in verses 6 through 8 uh, is sort of made out of a continuation of that assumption. He's coming to this realization. He's sort of bringing himself back to center, recognizing, okay, God has always been with me. He's always been with, you know, the generations before me. He's with me now. And he, he turns this into, again, this very honest prayer. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Here, uh, I've highlighted in yellow where David now begins to reflect on the circumstances, right? The 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 problem that he has around him. In this, in this case, you know, he uh, uses... Some, some illustrative language to, to reference this. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring, uh, like a ravening and roaring, uh, roaring lion. Um, so again, he's, he's recognizing the problem. So he's no more lamenting what he seems to be as, uh, or notices as God's absence, right? He's, he's recognizing God's presence and now he's focusing on the problem in front of him. Right? He's, he's turning his eyes to that. And what happens? What happens as soon as he does that? Look, you can tell by the coloring, right? Who's, what's, what's he looking at again? Again, he starts to sort of lament his personal situation here. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up uh, like a potsherd and my, my tongue sticks to my jaws. You... 
uh, lay me in the dust of death, right? So look what happens here. There's this, there's this series of emotions that happens, right? So there's this sort of self-loathing that happens, this, this sort of pity party that he's throwing. Uh, and I don't mean to downplay that, but th that's kind of, kind of what it is here. A little bit of a pity party there in the orange. Then he reflects on God's goodness. Still, still kind of having a moment there, verses 6 through 8, reflects again on God's goodness, makes it more personal, comes to a very genuine and sincere prayer. But then he looks at his problem again, right? He looks at the world around him and he looks at the problems that he's encountering, uh, these bulls, as, as he calls them, that are encompassing him, the, the ones that are surrounding him. Uh, and, and the first thing that happens is he again begins to lament over that. Right? He begins to start to, to sort of feel sorry for himself. What he has done is he has forgotten everything that he just reminded himself leading up to that. All of these sections here in green where he is reminding himself of God's goodness, he's forgotten those because he's focused on his problems and not on God. You see, the more he focused on God, the more he reminded himself of God's goodness, the better he seemed to feel about things, bringing himself to that, uh, uh, that, that recognition of God's close proximity and presence with him there in verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Right? Don't, don't go far from me. I know you're here. Be not far from me. Uh, but again, he looks at his problems and things begin to sink. We see this uh, again, even in the New Testament, right? You know, Peter on the water, right? As long as he focuses on Jesus, everything is just fine. He begins to focus on the storm around him, begin, begins to focus on the waters, and what happens? He begins to sink. Same sort of thing that we see right here. Uh, verse 16 continues on. He goes back to his problem, right? For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. All right, so this already should sort of paint a picture that seems very familiar, right? Some of the language that's being used here uh, in David describes very literally what would later happen to Jesus uh, in, in many ways here. But um, again, David corrects himself, right? So he has this focus on his problem goes back to sort of feeling sorry about a situation, focuses back on his problem, and now he's bringing his thoughts back to God. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And what follows after this is this sort of acceptance, this this understanding that God will redeem him. He hasn't done it yet, right? This this but this this understanding that God may as well have already come to his rescue. Uh, everything that follows, right? He begins to talk about how he is going to proclaim God's glory. He encourages those around uh, to proclaim God's glory. Uh, he talks about those that are afflicted, right? Uh, being being rescued like he is, right? At this point in time, there's there's no more thought of going back to his problems. All of the language that follows this comes from a place of assurance, of knowing that God will complete the work that he has started and that God will redeem him because he has not forsaken him. So that's a wonderful, wonderful reminder that, uh, that when we have trust in him, Right? When we focus on Him, when we leave uh, our focus on Him, we don't allow our focus to come off of Him, our mindset changes about the things that we deal with in this world around us. We're going to have situations, and of course our circumstances are not going to be uh, like David's. David's, of course, uh, David, of course, had a very unique set of circumstances um, that we do not share, but we have our own set of problems, right? And in many ways, uh, you know, it's not about comparing one person's problems to another's. We all have our own journey that we have to go through. But we're going to experience uh, trouble in this world. Again, we're, we're promised in scriptures that we will have trouble. Um, but when we focus on those problems, the first thing that we should do when those things come up, when those grab our attention, the first thing we need to do is remind ourselves of God's goodness. Follow the pattern that we see here 
in the text, right? Remind ourselves of God's faithfulness over the generations. Remind ourselves of God's faithfulness uh, in the, the, you know, the days leading up to this point, right? God has been good in your life. And because he has been good, you have every assurance and every bit of confidence to know that he is still good in your life and he will continue to be good in your life because he has told you as much. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. He's going to be there with you. And even if we don't see him immediately solving our problem, it's because he might be solving a bigger problem that we didn't even know was there. Right? That thing that's right in front of us may not always be the problem. God is always, 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 always there with us. We don't have to say to him, you know, be not far from me. He is always there. We just need to remind ourselves. And and it's hard sometimes to remind ourselves of that. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you are not, you know, connected with other, uh, other believers, if you are not in Christian fellowship, I want to encourage you, you know, make some friends, uh, find some people that you can lean on because we need those kind of people in our lives uh, that can come alongside us and, and remind us of God's goodness when we have forgotten. When we find ourselves in a place where it's difficult to remember God's goodness, to remember uh, His faithfulness, remember His provision, find yourself a friend that will do it for you. Find yourself someone that would say, hey, you remember that time God got you through this you know, one time before? You remember when God uh, provided that, that blessing that you needed? You remember the goodness of God. Someone that's going to encourage you to know that God can do it again. He always does, and he always will. I want to point out something else that we see here in this text that reminds us that what David is feeling here, what we sometimes feel, uh, you're not alone. You're not alone. In fact, uh, what we see here, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those very words are echoed by our Savior on the cross. That feeling of God forsaking us, and you know, in that case, you know, God truly did have to forsake him. We we sort of feel that way sometimes, but God hasn't actually. But um, God did have to uh, forsake His Son on that cross so that we would never be forsaken. Right? He had to forsake His own Son on that cross to uh, to allow Him to take upon Himself the sin of the world. Uh, to take that sin with him to the grave, to be resurrected again in the newness of life, right? That we can know him in that resurrected uh, life, that we can be filled in his spirit, right? Filled with his spirit, and that we, through all of that, are no more forsaken, right? We are no more uh, enemies of God. We have been um, reconciled to him through the blood of Jesus, so if you're feeling right now that God has left you, I want to remind you of the great lengths that God has taken to reunite you. He is still with you. Would you know me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would hear us when we cry out to you. Um, Lord, we have a great many needs in this world. We have a great many times in which we, um, we just cry out. Lord, we don't even know exactly what it is we need at times, but... Lord, we cry out to you. And it doesn't always feel that way, but Lord, we, we pray that you would remind us that you do hear us. Lord, that you would always uh, be near to us, that you would not be far from us, as, as David were to say. Lord, remind us that we are never forsaken. Remind us of your goodness and your mercy, because we are uh, so quick to forget your blessings. We're so quick to forget the things that you have done for us. If we can't do it ourselves, Lord, I pray that you would uh, join us together as a body. Draw us together that we might remind one another of your goodness and your grace. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you in the midst of our troubles. If, as we sort of see here in this psalm, we can become overwhelmed by the problems around us. When we fix our eyes on the problems right in front of us, uh, Lord, we quickly lose hope. And so we pray that you would help us to just fix our eyes on you. Not the problems. You're bigger than our problems. You're bigger than any problem we could face here in this earth. So help us to fix our eyes on you. And Lord, help us to proclaim your goodness. You are faithful in all things, Lord. You are faithful 
Um, and, and we want to make sure that this world around us knows us. Help us to glorify you because of your faithfulness. Help us to glorify you because of the things that you have done. Uh, help us to glorify you because of who you are. As we've said many times before, Lord, uh, you don't have to do anything. And you are worthy of our praise regardless. Lord, just for being who you are, for being holy, for being righteous, for being perfect, you are worthy of our praise. But you, you choose to do more than that. You choose to know us. You choose to love us. You choose to bless us. And Lord, for that, we should praise you all the more. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just put those words of praise on our lips. And Lord, that you would put ears around us to hear them. That others might be encouraged by your goodness. And we ask all of these things, praying in the way that you have taught us. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, as always, church family, it is a privilege to open the word with you. I pray that God reminds you this week of his, uh, his closeness to you. He reminds you of his love for you. He reminds you that you're never forsaken. You're loved. Until we uh, meet again next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you.